couple of weeks ago, Mickey preached last week, the week before that, I had an introduction to the book of First Peter, and we looked at who it was from and who it was to, the first couple of opening verses there in the book of First Peter. Now we're going to go on in chapter 1. I'm going to cover, chapter, I'm going to cover verses 3, 4, and 5, Peter's opening doxology. We're going to talk about that word as we get into our message today. All right, but first, I think this was humorous. You might not think so, but I thought it was funny. One Sunday, this was actually taken from the Reader's Digest. You know how they always have first-person stories there. One Sunday, we attended a church out of town that was more formal than our church. What our church called bread and juice in the communion service, this one referred to as the elements. Okay, I've referred to them as the elements, okay? She wasn't used to that. She always called it uh, bread and juice, but in this church they called it the elements. As communion began, the pastor said, if the deacons will come forward, the elements will pass among us. My son, William, was suddenly excited, and I didn't know why. Then he leaned toward me and whispered something that caused me to burst out laughing with all eyes on us, I took him by the hand and we made a hasty exit all the way to the car. He protested, Mom, we're going to miss the circus. The pastor said the elephants are going to pass among us. <laughs> I know it was funny. The elephants are going to pass among us. All right, all right. Now you disappointed me because I thought that was a funny guy. Let's get into our text today. Here's our text. We're going to look at chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Verse 3, Peter starts off with a doxology. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. All right, I hope you picked up. I hope I got. I got I know I'm using some of the odds and ends of this of this cardstock. Some pretty colored outline here for you. Uh, I hope you picked one of those up and you can fill in the blanks. <coughs> so here's my outline. Blessed, bless the Lord because, and that's what his whole text is about. He says we need to bless the Lord, and he tells us why we should bless the Lord. Well, point number two, why bless the Lord? Letter A, because of our new birth, because of our new birth. Letter B, because of our inheritance, verse 4. And C, because of our protection, in verse 5. So kind of, it makes kind of a nice sermon outline. We are to bless the Lord because of the new birth, because of our inheritance, and because of his protection in our lives. All right. Point number one, bless the Lord. I said because, and that's what the whole text is about. So bless the Lord, or blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I looked up that word in the original language, the word blessed. Here's the word, kind of an interesting word. You may recognize it. We have an English word that comes directly from it. The Greek word is eulogetos. You logatos. Okay, that's pomeda. It means to speak well of, to bless, or to praise. Praise be to the Lord because, or blessed be the Lord. Um, that's two words. It's a word the Greeks like to put. They would take prepositions and put on the front of words all the time. You probably realize that. We, we, we tore apart a whole bunch of different Greek words in my sermons. The second part, logotos, it comes from logos, the word. It means, it means word or it means to speak. The verb form of it means to speak. But it has a prefix on it. The EU prefix means 
to speak well of, good. What is the English word that we have from this? A, a eulogy. You go to a funeral, and uh, this has become very popular at funerals. The pastor will say, and we want to have a time of you sharing your remembrances of so-and-so. And people will pop up all over the, the auditorium and tell stories of what they remember of this past loved one. We call that eulogy, speaking well of, to eulogize somebody. Well, Peter uses this word of the Lord. We should bless the Lord. We should recognize that the Lord is the one who is in control of all areas in our life. And we should be thankful, and we should praise him, and we should bless him for all that we have. I use the word doxology. Theologically, that's the word that we use here. Well, doxology actually comes from a different word. I said in my title, I use the word doxology. This word comes from the Greek doxa, which means to give glory. So not just speak well of, but give glory, and then, of course, logos, which means to, to speak. So a doxology is to speak praise, speak glory to the Lord, okay? Um, though Peter uses the different word that we just looked at here, this is considered a doxology because Peter expresses that we should give glory to God and to bless him. Cross-reference here. I like this cross-reference. Many times you say to people, what is your life's verse? Do you have a life's verse? I don't know. You know, that, that was popular in years past that people would have a life's verse. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 was often a person's life verse. Okay, you can probably quote these verses. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Now, verse 6 in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. King James says, and he will direct your paths. But I want to look at this. In all your ways, we are to acknowledge that the Lord has his hand in it. You know, I have been frustrated. I've been picking on Alan because every time a building opens up that we could move into, Alan shoots it down for some reason. No, I've been, I've been frustrated that the Lord hasn't opened up the opportunity for us to get into a permanent spot. But I acknowledge that the Lord is in control of that. It's not that Stupid real estate person. No, I shouldn't say that. It's not that real estate person. It's not the market. The Lord has control of that. We need to acknowledge. I had a friend, whenever anything good happened, they would say, well, the Lord has just blessed me, and he would acknowledge the Lord. Anything bad happened, he would say, well, the Lord is in control of it, and he would acknowledge the Lord. We need to do that. We need to bless the Lord for all the good things that are in our life. And many times when we do that, we start thinking of all the physical blessings. We have, oh, we got my house, and we got our car, we got money in the bank, and we got good health. Paul and Peter, we're in the book of Peter now, they bless the Lord because of the spiritual blessings that we have in him. Far more important than just the physical blessings that we have. Okay, point number two, why bless the Lord? Well... Peter very clearly lays out three reasons why we are to bless the Lord. So the second part of verse 3, we are to bless him because of our new birth. We are to bless him because of our inheritance, and we are to bless him because of the protection that he gives on us. First of all, because of our new birth. Verse 3 uh, the second part, first part, he says, bless the Lord. And then he says, why? Because of our new birth. He says, according to his great mercy. Isn't that a neat phrase? I think that, that's something we are. You, know, you want to memorize something, you ought to memorize those five words. According to his great mercy. God gives us great mercy. What great mercy has he given us, Peter? He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are born again. I know, that's an evangelical term. I remember, I remember, I'm showing my age here, back when Jimmy Carter became president, 
I know, he was a Democrat. Oh, I shouldn't say that here. But he talked about being, he made it popular. He talked about being born again. Well, he's not the first one who brought it up. Peter says here, we, when you are unsaved and separated from God, dead in your trespasses and sin, uh, Paul talks about in Ephesians, and you place your faith and trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, then you become born again. You have a new creation inside of you. The inside of you becomes changed. You are born again. Let me give you a couple of cross-references. Of course, here is the famous one. Jesus was going around preaching, and the Sanhedrin, the rulers of the Jews, were against him. Most of them were against him. It seems, as you read the Gospels, there were two who really weren't against him. Joseph of Arimathea, who gave Jesus his tomb when Jesus died, took him off the cross when Jesus died. But the other one was a guy who was really questioning. This is a story about a man by the name of Nicodemus. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He was on the Sanhedrin. It says, this man came to Jesus by night. He, he didn't want to be seen in daytime coming up to Jesus because all the fellow Pharisees would say, oh, what's Nicodemus doing going to Jesus, you know? But <coughs> he went to Jesus by night so he wouldn't be seen. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus didn't answer that. Jesus didn't address that. Here's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He says, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus introduces here, the new birth, that when you come to faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, um, you become born again. He changes your nature. Now that doesn't mean automatically all of the old things are, and all of the consequences of the way you've been acting are gone, but you have a new nature and you begin to live for God. You have a changed life. You become born again. Here's another cross-reference. 1 Peter chapter 1. Hey, we're in 1 Peter chapter 1. Yeah, a little bit later on in the chapter, verses 22 and 23, Peter says it again. He says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly with a pure heart. And then in verse 23, he says, since because you have been born again. There it is again. Peter mentions it. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. We're going to talk about that word imperishable because he uses it up in our text as well. So Peter uses it again throughout the scripture. We, it talks about us needing to be born again. I didn't have the rest of that story of Nicodemus, but Nicodemus didn't understand. What? Do I got to enter a second time into my mother's womb? I don't understand. And Jesus kind of rebukes him. Jesus says, you mean you are a religious leader of the Jews and you don't understand the principle of the fact that you need to be born again? One more cross-reference, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I bet you some of you can quote that well-known verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He is born again. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Yeah, cross-references. I hope that today you have, are here and you have been born again. You have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and he has transformed your life. All right, secondly, because of... Uh, I'm trying to keep... I don't know, they, they put advertisements in my clock app now, and it keeps going to those. 
Point number two, because of our inheritance. Verse four, Peter says this, we've been born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's a wonderful verse. We have an inheritance, he says. All right, so I say, let's look at these adjectives. Well, the first one's the noun. It's not an adjective. We have an inheritance. You all know what an inheritance is. Mom and dad work hard all their life saving up and storing away in investments or in their home or whatever. And when they pass away, they go on to heaven, but they leave behind all their material possessions and it becomes an inheritance for the kids. It gets passed down to them. An inheritance. <coughs> we have an inheritance. When we became born again, we became born again into a new family, the family of God. Jesus has died. Of course, he rose again. But we have an inheritance from God, a home in heaven and all the blessings that come along with it. Now Peter sticks on some describing words, some adjectives. He says that, by the way, I looked up the, all of these adjectives in the, in the Greek, and they're, the translations we have are very good, accurate translations. There's uh, no interesting stories or associations behind them, so I didn't go into the Greek on, on all of these. First of all, we have an imperishable inheritance. Yesterday, uh, when I got up, we had power. Around 8 o'clock, just before I went to the men's study group, we heard a big pop outside somewhere in the community, and our electricity went off. A couple minutes later, got a text from, um, from the electric company that it would be fixed by 12.30. So, okay, no problem. Uh, got home at 12.30, I got another text that says it'll be fixed at 4.30. <laughs> Well, it finally came on at 2 o'clock last night. This morning it came on at 2 o'clock. So it was gone out all day. Fortunately, I had gone over to my son's house and gotten his, um, com um, not compressor, generator. generator. Yeah, I plugged our refrigerator into the generator so that our, uh, so that, so that our food in there did not perish. A couple months back, my wife got sick of them and went to Myers and bought see-through plastic containers to store our leftovers with. Previous to that, we would use like butter tubs or whipping cream tubs to store our left. There are perfectly good plastic containers. Why throw them away? You know, I... I hate to be a hoarder, but uh, the problem is with them, you can't see what's in them. And what would happen in our refrigerator, and I'll just bet it happens in your refrigerator too, that you put things in those tubs and you put the cover on them, you put it in the refrigerator, and you pretty soon forget what's in there and it gets pushed farther back and it gets farther back and it gets farther back. Pretty soon it's sitting at the back of the refrigerator. It stays there for months at a time. And finally you say, I wonder what's in that old butter tub. And you look at it and you open it up and it stinks and it's got mold all over it. It has perished huh it is perishable we go to the grocery store we buy perishable goods why because they perish you know a lot of stuff perishes peter says our inheritance is imperishable it will not deteriorate it will not go bad it will not get rancid it will not ferment you know? Secondly, he says, not only is our inheritance imperishable, but it is undefiled. Undefiled. I, I did look up all of these words in the Greek, 
and the, the second part of them, uh, very clear translation, but they all have the, what is called in Greek, the alpha fricative. I know, that sounds funny, but it's an alpha, an A, our letter A, on the front of them, which makes it negative, makes it the opposite meaning. We have that as well. We have moral and we have amoral, not immoral. You know, immoral is, is, is evil, but amoral means it's not moral. There's no moral about it. Yeah, so we use the alpha on the front of words as well. Well, that's what all three of these had. It is undefiled. That word defiled was well, kind of interesting. Literally, it meant... Um, not stained. And it kind of gave a word picture of a white cloth. They would weave cloth and they would weave, you know, different colors, but sometimes they would weave a white cloth. But if it got a stain on it, um, it would be considered defiled. It would be a spotted cloth and couldn't be used and sold for as much anymore. Well, this word has the alpha on the front of it, means it's not spotted, it is not mixed, it is undefiled. You've probably heard of the old illustration, I got this big gallon of, let's just say, Kool-Aid up here, and then I pull out of my pocket a little tiny bottle of poison, and I take a little ink dropper, and I get just a little bit of poison, and I drop it into that gallon jar of Kool-Aid. And then I say, okay, we're going to pass out. No, we're not. We're not. Some of you don't even remember this, but Jimmy Jones passed out the Kool-Aid to his cult following, so they would all die. But I'd start passing this Kool-Aid around, and it's. I would say it's only got a little tiny drop of poison in it. It's okay. I'll bet you not very many of you would drink that Kool-Aid. Even though it was 99% Kool-Aid, maybe 99.999% Kool-Aid, it still was defiled. Well, our inheritance that we have in, here in heaven is undefiled. And then he uses another adjective, <coughs> unfading, unfading. What was it? Two weeks ago, we went up to Bambi Lake and did some. Mickey and I did some painting, and uh, Nancy had gotten the the working guy there to bring us the paint. There were two different colored paints. There was a real light gray. Nancy called it white, and then there was this uh, blue, blue gray, and Mickey and I started using that on the building. It had been painted last year but there were parts of it they didn't finish, and then there were parts that were peeling off and stuff that we were touching up. The problem is when we put this paint on, it didn't quite match. And we thought, well, you know, wet paint is always slightly different colored than dry paint, but even when it dried, it wasn't quite the same color. And we were trying to decide whether it was and off a different color because they'd gotten it from a different store, or if in the one year that building, the paint that was on that building had faded a little bit because of the sun on it. I think it was because they got it at a different store. I don't think, Mickey, that paint would have faded in a year. You're more expert on paint. Faded. You think it... Oh. Yeah, last August. But paints fade. Things fade. You take cloth and you put it outside and you leave it out in the sun and the weather, it will fade. Kind of interesting to watch in the, in the late winter, early spring. Uh, you got snow all over the ground and you get a nice sunny day and, and the snow just gradually fades away. Pretty soon you got some lawn and then more lawn and then all you got is some little piles of snow left around. It fades away. Well, our inheritance don't do that. I, I, I remember a friend who, uh, and he wasn't bitter about it, but uh, his parents were elderly and sick and um, 
he thought there would be kind of a nice inheritance when they passed away. Not that he was greedy for the inheritance, but but then his, mo his mother got sick and was placed in the nursing home and there were some bad investments. And finally, when his mom and dad did pass away, there wasn't any inheritance left. They had used almost everything up. And he was okay with that, but the, the inheritance faded away in this life. Well, Peter says that's not going to happen to our inheritance. Why? Because it is kept in heaven for us. It is there. It is kept in heaven. Peter says we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for us. Here's a cross-reference, good cross-reference. Jesus says almost the same thing. Matthew chapter 6, he says, this is in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, <coughs> verse 19 and 20, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Things get destroyed if they're left on this earth. Everything perishes, fades away. Huh? Do not lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, because in heaven there isn't any moth, there isn't any rust, and thieves can't break into heaven and steal your inheritance. It is secure. What a wonderful inheritance we have because of Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. <coughs> point number, well, point letter C, because of our protection. God protects us. Notice this. Who, talking about us, by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We, by God's power, not man's power, not our own power, but by God's power, are being guarded in our Christian life. I looked up that word guarded. It comes from the Greek word, and let me get it here, fro, fro, re, o, fro, fru, re, o, I guess is a good way to pronounce it, fru, re, o. Here's the exact definition out of the Greek lexicon. It means to guard, to keep watch. Like a military sentinel to guard actively, actively display whatever defense or offensive means are necessary to guard something. So you put a military detachment on to guard something so that it won't... I, I think of Pilate put some Roman guards over the tomb, but that didn't keep Jesus Christ in the grave. But, but of course, this is not by man's power. This guarding of our lives is, remember, by God's power, it said in that verse. I just wanted to show you where that word was used in Scripture. Paul is talking as he writes to the Corinthians about how he escaped from Damascus. He says, at Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding, there's our word, guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hand. So that guarding didn't work so well. But, but when we are guarded by the power of God, we cannot lose our salvation. We are guarded by the power of God. Cross-reference, John 10. John 10 Boy, that sounds familiar. It seems like somebody last week <coughs> preached from John chapter 10 about the good shepherd, about the door. Well, right in that very passage that Mickey preached about, it says this, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And then he goes one step farther. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. People don't sneak up behind God, and when God's not looking, they reach up and they reach into his hand, and they grab you, and they make you lose your salvation. No, no, that don't happen. Do you ever play that game? It used to be a game that we played. You placed a penny in your hand, 
and the other guy facing you there would stand there and he had to be quick enough to grab the penny out of your hand before you quickly close. You ever play that game? Any of you ever play that game? Yeah, kind of a fun game. Uh, my brothers, they would do that when I was little. And of course, they were real quick and I wasn't too smart at it at that age. And, and uh, they would always get that penny out of my hand before I could close it. But you want to know something? Nobody can do that with God. God keeps us in his hand. Guards us. Protects us. All right, here's the conclusion. I just put some, kind of summing up. Peter blesses the Lord, praises the Lord because of our new birth, because of our inheritance, and because of the protection that we have from the Lord in our spiritual lives. Our hearts should realize that the Lord has given to us as believers of what the Lord has given to us as believers, and we should acknowledge him in all our ways. That's something we need to practice in our lives, acknowledging that the Lord is with you, everything that happens to you is under control of the Lord, and give him praise and blessing because of it. And then we are born again. You are a new creation in the Lord. You need to live out that new creation that you are, when you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for this text in 1 Peter. Help us as we go through this book to fully understand the blessings you give to us. And Father, thank you for these blessings that are listed here. We've been born again. We have an inheritance. And Father, our inheritance is reserved in heaven, undefiled, imperishable. And Father, you guide our lives while we are here until we get to receive that inheritance. Thank you, Father. May we give you praise and glory for that. In Jesus' name, amen.